Well, um, as uh, this, uh, this extraordinary uh, uh, great and, uh, day of uh, discussion on terrorism financing is ending, I would like to, um, uh, to do two things. First, uh, to congratulate you and congratulate uh, the organizers of this meeting on behalf of the president of the International Association of Penal Law, uh, Professor Jose Luis de la Cuesta, uh, who asked me to apologize because he, he was intending to come but uh, could not because of uh, um, um, other uh, commitment. Um, I, I, it's, um, it has been uh, extremely well uh, organized but also um, uh, extremely lively and uh, informative. I must say that it was uh, for me uh, a real pleasure to uh, listen to all these uh, lectures. Many of them are, are old friends. And I, as we are talking of old friends, I would like now, which was the second thing I wanted to tell you, to introduce Richard Barrett, uh, who, will, uh, who will address uh, the meeting for the uh, um, uh, for its closure. Uh, Richard is, as you know, the, uh, the head of the uh, uh, team of experts of uh, the, uh, uh, the um, sanctions, um, sorry, the <laughs> coordinator analytical support and sanction monitoring team of the Se Security Council Committee for Al-Qaeda and the Taliban, what we call uh, more easily the 1267 Committee. Uh, um, Richard has been uh, heading and coordinating this team of experts since 2004. Uh, when I was in the IMF, uh, I had uh, the pleasure and the, the honor to work with uh, Richard in a, um, a task force uh, called the Counterterrorism Task Force, which was created by the UN Secretary General to uh, uh, to um, gather and coordinate the efforts of uh, all organizations of the UN system. Uh, as part of this, um, this uh, task force, I had the chance to work with Richard, and it has uh, been uh, always a, uh, a pleasure to, uh, to, to work with him and to uh, reflect on the issues related to the fight against terrorism and terrorism financing. Uh, Richard, please. It's a long day. Jean-Francois, thank you very much for that introduction and thank you to Case Western for asking me to join you here today and for the opportunity to give this sort of closing um, speech, remarks, whatever. I'm not going to attempt to try to sum up what we've heard today from the various panels, though much of it, I think, has been extremely interesting and very pertinent um, in that sense of the word uh, to, to what we're all trying to do here, which is essentially to counter terrorism. And I know we have difficulty in agreeing what terrorism is, what it means, uh, but I think that the international community is quite firmly opposed to terrorism, and it certainly is opposed to terrorism in the form of Al-Qaeda and Taliban-related terrorist acts. It's difficult for the international community to do something about particular regional groups, like, for example, ETA or the Tamil Tigers, or even to do things about groups such as Hamas and Hezbollah. Part of their movements are undoubtedly terrorist but not all of their movement is terrorist, and it's a difficulty, I think, to attack the part without affecting the whole. And I think that that is not, um, of course, a position shared by everybody in, in the international community, but unless you keep the international community working largely by consensus, then the whole thing collapses. And that's certainly true, in my opinion, when you come to dealing with Al-Qaeda, because if you start adding, for example, to our list, people who may be so peripherally involved with Al-Qaeda that they look more as if they're involved, for example, with Hamas, then the international consensus will begin to crumble 
and implementation will become non-existent, or anyway, so patchy as to be meaningless. So these are, these are issues that, that we all you know, deal with, compromise and so on. Um, it's not perfect. But I think that at the moment we have a, a pretty strong international resolve to deal with terrorism. Well, turning to, to financing of terrorism, of course, over the last six years or so, there's been a considerable concentration on financing of terrorism. Um, the world, the international community, has adopted a massive new regulation, not just at the international level, but also at regional and national levels as well. And we may think first and foremost of the international regime as exemplified by Resolution 1373, which was passed in 2001, and Resolution 1267, the sanctions, first sanctions resolution, which was passed in 1999. Uh, but, of course, there are many other international systems and regulations, and I think it would be a brave country, a confident country, which ignored the FATF recommendations, the special recommendations um, on countering financing of terrorism, even though, of course, they're not mandatory. And then beyond that, you have the uh, obligation of member states, for example, the member states of the European Union, to observe the European Union uh, regulations. And then you have the national regulations, for example, in this country, very strong regulations, which have, of course, an international impact because they govern uh, financial institutions which are doing business in the United States, or um, as well, of course, as US financial institutions that are doing business abroad. So they have an extraterritorial, um, if not application, certainly impact. Uh, there's, unsurprisingly perhaps you might think, a huge similarity between the various uh, financial uh, uh, regulations that have been introduced, whether national or international. Um, you might think, well, that's surely uh, absolutely logical and pretty essential indeed that national, regional and international legislation should and regulation should um, accord. But I think it's probably worth asking why that is. Uh, is it because the regulation is all designed to attack the same sort of terrorist methodology? Or is it because the regulators have identified weak points in the various financial systems which could be exploited for terrorist purposes. And whichever one it is, does it really matter? Well, I think we, sh we, could, we could explore that a little. Um, I think that modern terrorism, of course, presents very many challenges to our world today. Uh, not least, of course, to understand why apparently well-balanced, well-educated uh, young people from you know, fairly stable backgrounds very often, should be prepared to kill themselves and to kill other people along with them uh, to draw attention to a situation without proposing any solution. It is for you and me, I think, or I hope for you, but certainly for me, a, a bizarre act, that act of suicide bombing which so typifies al-Qaeda. In the UK recently, um, uh, an advisor to Tony Blair, a guy called Jonathan Pohl, who um, was uh, very much in, involved in the uh, business of dealing with the IRA, just published a book of memoirs, and he said in that about how negotiations with the IRA were begun and how they were conducted and how they led eventually to helping peace or the, the cessation of hostilities. And that, of course, led to quite a lot of comment and talk in the press about whether that was applicable to today's terrorism, whether we shouldn't be seeking out al-Qaeda and negotiating with al-Qaeda. And many people, many eminent people, suggested that that would be perhaps a good idea. But, of course, there are very many reasons why an analogy between the IRA and al-Qaeda doesn't work and, and cannot work. And I think it would be easy to illustrate one of them by asking you as a group of informed and well-educated people who are interested in terrorism and know something about al-Qaeda to suggest what the principal issues would be that would be on the table for negotiation. 
I think that you, and certainly I, would find it hard to describe, describe them, and certainly hard to describe them in a way that they could be negotiated. I mean, terrorism is a political act, of course. It, it, it seeks political change. Um, but the terrorism that Al-Qaeda perpetrate is more, in my view, a form of political protest which seeks a cultural change. It seeks a writing of wrongs, but it seeks a rewriting of history. I don't see Al-Qaeda has any particular forward program. Uh, it's not like the IRA in wanting more influence over any particular area of politics. It just wants the world to be different. And as such, it has uh, strengths because its appeal is so broad and so vague that anyone with even a personal grievance can relate to that, to relate to that agenda and feel that it will include it and be able, and, and that individual can express their grievances within the sort of Al-Qaeda umbrella. And it so, uh, sort of projects also a sense of idealism, which may be um, at least superficially appealing and uh, apparently sort of okay. But I think that breadth of its appeal is also its strategic weakness. I think that because it has no <clears throat> particular benchmarks against which it can measure its progress, its ultimate legacy will be pretty minimal, quite frankly. And I think that the realization of that is, um, <clears throat> is spreading more and more, and I think is undermining, actually undermining its appeal. The fact that it has a, such a general appeal and such a wide range of adherents, such a wide range of supporters who may be supporting it all for very, very many different reasons, also, I think, go to demonstrate that it doesn't have a very highly organized structure. I think that people have often thought that Al-Qaeda somehow is able to keep in touch with all these small cells all over the, all over the world, whether through the internet or some, some other means, and direct their, their activities and, and have sort of ready feedback and so on, and act in the way that Al-Qaeda indeed did in the early days when it was trying to organize all the Arab fighters in Afghanistan, put them up, help their travel, you know, deploy them to various Taliban units or in groups of Arab fighters or whatever. Then indeed it was, was uh, organized and, uh, and, and well established in, 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 a, in a physical sense, but, it, but with a great deal of help from um, governments. But now it doesn't have any proper structure any established system of recruitment, of training, or of financing, or of operational planning. Even in the early days, when it was uh, a more effective organization based in, in Afghanistan, I think it was pretty chaotic, quite frankly. I don't know if, you re if any of you have read Lawrence Wright's uh, book, The Looming Tower, but I think that gives a very good picture of you know, the pretty desperate efforts of al-Qaeda including Osama bin Laden, to add to the discomfort of the Russians in Afghanistan. I think that Al-Qaeda, therefore, its strength at the moment is much more as an idea. And this is a very common thing that lots of people have said. But it's an idea which individuals and groups can follow, and they can operationalize, if you like. They can execute that idea as they think they should, as they indeed are able to, or as their circumstances allow them, or even as their imagination allows them. It's true, and it was mentioned earlier today, that various training manuals have been found, uh, various treatises that have been, have been found about tactics and so on. Yeah, that's absolutely true. There's one that was found in Manchester some years ago. But actually, these are written by individuals. They, they're not uh, read uh, by everybody, and they're not followed even by a few people. The decision to plan an attack rests very much with the individual and the individual cell in which he operates. And the form that it takes, therefore, also rests with him. 
The, if you look back at 9-11, of course, the, things, things were different then. And 9-11 was a sort of watershed time, not only in terms of terrorism, but in terms of regulation as well. And the events of 9-11 demanded an immediate and massive international response. There's no doubt. It was, a, it was a pretty massive attack, an amazingly graphic, a hugely significant attack. Very, very clever, very simple, very clever, well-planned and everything. But even at that time, you know, on the 10th of September, it wasn't clear what the response should be. It wasn't as if the attacks of 9-11 had suddenly revealed how al-Qaeda planned its operations, how it financed its operations, where it recruited its personnel, and so on. All it did do was to demonstrate to all the world the scope of al-Qaeda's ambition, uh, the vulnerability, if you like, of the world to their sort of attack planning. And it also diverted and immediately diverted a huge amount of resources to counterterrorism programs. But generally, I may say that some of you in this room will have been there at the time and may disagree, but generally, before the programs that, that had been developed that were capable of absorbing those resources. So you had a huge influx of resources with everybody saying, oh, well, we don't want to give up this money, these extra people and so on. What should we do with them? And this led to um, a certain amount of um, redundancy, I might say, in the counterterrorism world, although that's now settled down. And similarly, just as resources were devoted by national governments, so too the international community was compelled and I mean compelled to do something, you know, not just to sit down and say, oh dear, it's very bad. And so Resolution 1373, which was passed within three weeks of the attacks of 9-11, it would be unreasonable to expect that resolution suddenly to have said, ah, these are all the things we need to do to stop terrorism. Let's just list them down. Yeah, we now know, we now understand, because of these attacks in the United States, what we have to do. So it didn't either achieved that, it didn't set out a whole new regime, and nor did it attempt to set out a whole new regime. What it did was to collect up lots of bits and pieces which had already been negotiated and discussed in international forums and put them together in a mandatory resolution, which was, which was helpful. It was a very good thing to do. And most of the bits and pieces uh, were, were taken from, for example, the International Convention on the Suppression of Terrorist Financing which was slowly being uh, adopted and ratified by states. But this ensured that states had to get on with it, and that was it. So it was Chapter 7, just do it. So the Resolution 1373, uh, against which there was no protest in the General Assembly, although it was a Security Council resolution <coughs> taking over an area of, of work that very traditionally had been done with, by the General Assembly in the Sixth Committee, it was the Security Council saying, right, you leave that, we're going to take this. This is now clearly a threat to international peace and security. It comes under our mandate and not under yours. There was no opposition to that, and therefore it did successfully accelerate the process of international agreement on counter-terrorist activity. And if I may say, I think the first uh, eight FATF special recommendations were similar they were all agreed, I think, in October 2001. So again, very, very soon after the attacks of 9-11. But that action, that Resolution 1373, the FAT of Special Recommendations, really set the world agenda, I think, for the last six years on counter-terrorist financing and what should be done about it. A lot of the work that's been done has been good in itself, you know, even without terrorist financing, it's been good in itself. Maybe um, some bankers would object, but nonetheless, a better regulation, a better consideration of what regulation is needed in the financial sector is surely no bad thing. And that is good whether or not there's less terrorism as a result. But again, I'd like to remind you that, in, well, anyway, in my opinion, an awful lot of that regulation is not necessarily how terrorists were financing their own operations, but more in how we thought that they might be financing their operations and how we thought we might prevent them from doing so. Well, 
that's not an original thought, of course, and indeed our mandate in the monitoring team uh, uh, really recognizes that. The Security Council has tasked us to <clears throat> analyze how terrorists fund their operations, to examine the effect of current regulation on their ability to fund their operations, to consult <coughs> member states and others, including the private sector, on challenges presented by implementation, and to draw up recommendations for change. The 9-11 Commission did a great job in analyzing the way in which the attacks in the United States had been financed. And it was quite clear that quite a lot of money had been spent, relatively speaking, and with fairly limited care in security terms. There were shared accounts, there were separate accounts receiving payments from the same source, there were many unexplained transfers, and this sort of thing. But these didn't raise any alarms at the time and even now actually might ex escape scrutiny. They might not raise any red flags now, lost as they would be in the vast number of daily transactions that pass through the international banking system. But had any one cell member been subject to investigation, I think the money trails would have very quickly revealed the others and also I think would have revealed uh, enough about the plot for people to have taken uh, immediate action and stopped it. In fact, I just say there that in all the terrorist cases that I've ever come across, the investigation, the post-act investigation, has relied tremendously on uh, the financial leads. It's, it's quite extraordinary how much our banks and our bankers know about us, much more than our doctors do or anybody else, certainly our colleagues, you know, because they have all the details, where your money's coming from and how you're spending it, what sort of patterns and so on. And uh, I'm sure Mr. Spitzer is not the only one to have realized that. But just as these um, financial transactions by the 9-11 hijackers rang no alarm bells, there was nothing that particularly raised the relevant authorities' attention towards the hijackers themselves because their behavior too in those days did not stand out sufficiently from the mass of other individuals who are moving in, in and out and around the United States who might have attracted attention. You know, we read now of missed leads and failures to share information, and it may be true that if the system had worked better, uh, the plot might have been discovered, but, you know, this is with hindsight, and hindsight is pretty good. And to tell the truth, I think that even today, if a similar plot was being hatched, though with much better security, probably in its financing, uh, they would get away with it. Because security agencies, just like the financial community, has to pick out available leads um, from all these suspicious activity reports, suspicious um, transaction reports, or whatever you want to call them, uh, which have increased exponentially. So it's not that you just get one or two coming in and you look at them very carefully. You get hundreds and thousands of them. And in this country, I believe, there's quite an efficient system of looking through them. But in many countries, I can tell you, they just pile up on the floor and nobody does anything with them at all. That is, if they get them. So I think that the, although there's a huge, a hugely greater number of people looking at all this material, there's uh, so much more material to look at that they almost cancel each other out, certainly in many, many parts of the world. Having said that, I'd also like to, to, to make a general remark about terrorism because for all its sort of front page billing and its sort of banner headlines, terrorism is pretty small potatoes still, you know, in the overall sort of activity in the world. I mean, the threat that it poses is very real, but it's not as great as perhaps some people would have us believe, particularly in an election year. And, you know, the, but the purpose of terrorism is to terrorize, is to scare people, is to influence policy through that fear. And in that respect, Al-Qaeda is very successful. And it also benefits, I think, from being a natural partner for journalists and for politicians too. And although I know it's very simplistic to say that many more people will die each year in road traffic accidents will, than will die in 
terrorist attacks, um, you know, because we know the dangers of driving and, and we assume that other drivers aren't out to kill us, although they may appear to be. Um, but we should remember that the victims of terrorism, even in areas where terrorism is very pre prevalent, are, are, are fairly few. And the impact remains, fortunately, fairly small. It's not to say that it needn't be, but, but it is at the moment. So the best that the counter-terrorism community can do is to try and keep those numbers as low as possible. And I think that's you know, a sensible objective. Um, I think that, for me, the key thing in dealing with international terrorism and al-Qaeda-related terrorism is to try and keep the leadership, the experienced leadership, isolated from the people who support them, all those sort of wannabe terrorists who are out there and attracted by the message. As long as we keep the leadership under pressure, we restrict their movements, limit their finances, then I think the sanctions regime and all the other regulation that exists can help to constrict their influence and constrict their opportunity in two important respects. I think first in providing training for people, because although you can say, well, there's lots of training available on the internet, you can even learn apparently how to make a sort of nuclear bomb, if you like, on the internet or something. The fact is, and we've seen it over the last two or three years in terrorist attacks, that terrorist cells who are teaching themselves, taking instruction off the internet, have been much, much less effective than they would have been had they had a guy saying, no, don't do it like this, do it like that. It's like baking a cake or some other cooking thing. You can look at the recipe, that's great. But if you're some, there's somebody with you who says, well, no, actually, it's quicker if you do this, or just chuck that in like that, don't bother about that, you get a better product. I think it's the same with terrorism. And the other issue is security. The security of terrorist cells at the moment is pretty poor, it's pretty low, and has allowed a great deal more success by intelligence and security agencies than we used to enjoy in the past. And we wouldn't want necessarily there to be uh, a collection of experience and a development of training as a result of that in security measures. So I think it's really important to try and keep these two groups apart, the experienced leadership and the sort of wannabe followers who are thereby restricted into operating on their own in their own small cells. If you look, we, we deal with Taliban and Al-Qaeda, and I think it's quite interesting to see the different fortunes of those two groups as a result of international activity. The Taliban has a local agenda, has a local ba uh, battleground, it recruits locally from the neighborhood, mainly through tribal connections, and it has no problem in moving about through its area of operation. It seeks confrontation when it wants it, finds it with the Afghan forces, with the international forces, when it's ready to fight. And it has a great deal of access to money because of the drug trade, it can um, tax poppy farmers, probably about 10% of their product, which is huge when you think of the a vast amount of poppy produced in Afghanistan, and is able to recruit very many young men who probably have um, either no other source of employment or certainly no better source of employment, and has ample room and space and time to train and equip them. And also with the Taliban, there's nobody out there saying, you know, the Taliban, why support the Taliban? Look what they do. You know, they make all your women dress up and stay inside and your daughter's not able to go to school and they sort of want to reintroduce some sort of bizarre um, medieval form of government. But, you know, local government in Afghanistan is not much better. Still get the local officials coming around and um, taking bribes off you, not administering justice properly, and not, importantly, not providing you security against the Taliban. So really you're caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, so the Taliban, I would say, is relatively successful. And at the moment, the insurgency is, is doing pretty well, despite the efforts of ISAF, coalition forces, and the Afghan forces. A lot of um, mid-level commanders have been taken out, which is a good disincentive for them. So some of them may decide just to take the money and run to Dubai. But nonetheless, there's a very strong movement still. 
But on the other hand, the al-Qaeda leadership really faces some difficulties because while the Taliban has money, the al-Qaeda leadership doesn't have very much money. And it has big expenses, as was mentioned earlier. It has to rent all its compounds at very inflated prices. It has to buy the support of the locals. It has to buy the, you know, the, the not loyalty, but um, at least pay them not to, 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 to go and take the rewards for justice type money, which is out there. It has to pay for the, for the families of fighters who have died. And it has to maintain this propaganda structure, which was also mentioned earlier, which is its main weapon at the moment. And its income remains uncertain. It can't rely on an annual poppy crop, but it has to rely on donations reaching, usually in suitcases carried in from the Gulf, or in the pockets of the few people who manage to make contact. And while the Taliban can recruit from that large pool of sort of bored and disaffected Afghan youth, um, and organize those forces. The Al-Qaeda leaders are too cut off and they're too isolated to be able to gather up and direct their recruits, except in a very isolated and haphazard manner. I think actually there are many people who would join Osama bin Laden and Ayman al-Zawahiri if they could, but the journey is difficult, foreigners stick out, and the destination is unknown. In part because the uh, leaders want to hide and uh, the, the, no one knows where they are, but also because they're very suspicious of allowing anyone near them for, th for fear that they may be um, from the security authorities. And it's interesting that the only plots which have actually showed an al-Qaeda link-up, an al-Qaeda leadership link-up, have been by British of uh, Pakistani origin because it's in that area of Pakistan that the al-Qaeda leaders are. And so their, their contacts can move in and out without too much trouble. And it's interesting, too, perhaps, to reflect that the plot that was disrupted recently in Germany, you remember Fritz Gilovich and uh, his two um, friends who were trying to attack U.S. bases there and Frankfurt Airport, linked up with the Islamic Jihad movement, which is a, which is a Islamic Jihad Union, in fact, they call it now, which is an Uzbek movement, because it was easier to find them than it was to find the core al-Qaeda leadership. And al-Qaeda also faces this very real ideological challenge now because um, they're not themselves uh, qualified as religious scholars and their audience is becoming increasingly sceptical and critical as they see more and more Muslims killed as a result of terrorist attacks and they're rather uncertain about the direction of the movement. And, uh, for example, when you get people like Saeed Imam, who's... Um, was a, a, a colleague and mentor, indeed, of Zawahiri, who's currently in prison in Egypt, saying that al-Qaeda has overreached itself, it's doing the wrong thing, and it shouldn't be uh, attacking Muslims, then there's a real ideological challenge which has to be addressed, and it's quite hard to address. And I think that the, the result of all that is that al-Qaeda, the leadership at least, is becoming more and more irrelevant in the broader uh, debate over the nature a political change in the Middle East, which is essentially what it's all about. And that is leading to, a, fortunately, a downward spiral of their influence right now. But um, just back, back to the money. Um, I think the, the, the most common form of terrorist financing at the moment is by individual cells that are raising money through either legal or illegal means uh, in order to buy the ingredients of a homemade bomb. Um, they the money they raise is inevitably relatively small and also inevitably relatively difficult to distinguish from a mass of other low-level financial crime that often doesn't even attract police attention. The cells have remained local or homegrown, as, as people say, and that is not because the leadership is unwilling to give them money to fund bigger attacks, uh, because it's, but because it's difficult to get that money to them securely. So we're doing something right. Uh, I'll just leave that. Um, so I think that what we can say is that the, although we may fear that the um, amount of international regulation that we have at the moment has a limited impact on the current financing of terrorist cells, by, particularly by homegrown uh, cells of terrorists, it's been quite good as a way to limit 
the ability of al-Qaeda to develop into an organization and to be able to perpetrate larger attacks than it has. I think that the, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a point of diminishing returns, though, and I think we're wrong to think that the tighter we regulate the financial market, the less terrorism we'll see. I don't quite see that correlation anymore. And if you think of the amount of money being generated by organized crime and moved, moved about in organized crime, it's absolutely enormous. I'm reading a book at the moment called Mac Mafia. I think it's just about to come out here by a guy called Misha Glennie. It's unbelievable about how, how large organized crime is. Um, the imagination that criminals use to raise money illegally and the ease with which they do it. So I'd say that this was a pretty good point, actually, for uh, taking a thorough review of our CFT policy and regulation and look at it increasingly from the terrorist point of view. Uh, I think we should be uh, accepting that we are on six years from 9-11, um, that there's now very, very much more evidence of how terrorists finance their oper operations through all the trials that have come to court and through the investigations that have been made. And I think that it's a good time to look at all that evidence and see if there's actually any patterns and anything that we could do to ensure that we try to prevent this smaller scale terrorist financing. I think that we have to accept probably that a lot of terrorist financing is largely opportunistic and that there may not be discernible patterns, but even coming to that conclusion will be useful. And I think if we do that, we'll, we'll achieve two things. We'll make counterterrorism financing more effective and we will increase the confidence among all those who are involved in it that what we're doing is worthwhile. And that surely will deal to a more thoughtful and willing engagement by the financial community. And I think we'll be able to claim success or at least very significant progress when we can be sure that people are not doing things out of fear of the regulator or worrying that they may be blamed for making a wrong decision, but doing something based on the belief in an effective pro, uh, process which takes advantage not just of the knowledge that we built in counterterrorism but also the knowledge that sits there in financial institutions from, of people who have a nose as well as experience in looking for something which is dodgy, to use the jargon of today. Um, I think there's still a real threat that a terrorist attack may set off a dirty bomb in an urban center or start bringing aircraft crashing out of the skies. And we have to protect against that. That's <laughs> clearly vital that we do so. But also, at the same time, I fear we may have to live and accept that there's going to be a certain amount of terrorist attacks which we'll know nothing about before they happen. But we can achieve the former and maybe cope better with the latter if I think the financial community, the regulators, the intelligence community, and everybody else can work more closely together. So, thank you. Richard, Richard uh, shortened his presentation at my request, so I think it's only appropriate that we lengthen it by an appropriate <laughs> interval. Are we aiding and abetting bin Laden and Al-Qaeda by talking about him so much, by publicizing his videos, by lionizing him, in effect, as being so all-important? And if so, how do we avoid that? Uh, I think that's a very good point, and, and I agree that, that we are. I don't, I don't think it's easy to stop doing that, and he's very good at projecting this image without actually having to provide any substance behind it. But the more we expose al-Qaeda activity for what it is, which is criminality and violence, and violent criminality, if you like, and the more the sort of specious arguments that they put forward for, in justification are exposed as being specious and baseless, then the better we'll be. And I think there is progress in that. And now I can tell you that there's a considerable international movement to do that. Not for us, perhaps to attack the religious arguments that he's putting forward, but when you get people like Saeed Imam or the, um, uh, the Mufti in Saudi Arabia the other day, 
saying things which, you know, and these are not people who are thought to be in the government pocket, but they're saying things that directly go against what Osama bin Laden stands for and what Zawahiri is saying. I think that's helpful to demythologize him and bring him back to being just a, a guy in a cave. You know. I want to thank Richard. Uh, <laughs> and I want to thank all of the participants. This has been, uh, I mean, this is self serving, I suppose, to say, but I think it has been a wonderful day. And thank all of you. Uh, there is a reward for your stamina. We have a reception upstairs, out around the corner. We'll find it. It won't be far. Um, and it is an opportunity to continue the conversation in a more informal way. And thank you again, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.